the theme of developing a, uh, an eternal perspective in a temporal arena and contextualizing that in the larger whole of an understanding of what it means to deal with adversity, pain, sorrow, suffering, affliction, all those setbacks uh, that we see every day and that touches us in dif differing and unique ways. I have a monthly teaching letter. Most of you are getting this. Uh, anyone not getting this reflections teaching letter? Most of you are getting it. But it's um, the August edition has a prayer that I thought I should read to you that's absolutely relevant to our, our d discussion. So I thought I would uh, read it. It's a prayer of hope, and it relates to this perspective that we need to cultivate. Lord God, just as you prepared and called Abram out of obscure beginnings, so you laid your hand upon me and called me to a glorious destiny. But along the journey, I realized that there are times when you will take me to the end of my own resources to teach me that only your resources are sufficient. You call into being that which did not exist and bring life out of barrenness. You have implanted a living hope within me and you teach me again and again, sometimes through hardship and uncertainty, that any other hope will let me down. By your loving power, may I put my hope in those things you have promised and not in the people, possessions, and positions of this fleeting world. I thank you for the living hope I have received through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That pretty well summarizes where I'm heading here, the perspective that we need to cultivate in a difficult uh, world. We see that there is pain, that there is adversity, that there is affliction. We need to have a perspective as well on how precious uh, the, the present is and what opportunities we have. Um, there is a verse that I'd like to begin with that uh, is found in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. And I think we've mentioned this um, a few months ago. Of course, none of you will remember this, so it's totally irrelevant. I, I, I can tell things to you again with impunity. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't want. Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> In talking about a world where things are not as they should be, where there's moral evil, there is uh, what's often called natural evil, we see the need for a biblical perspective. And it's significant that our Lord addressed this in this particular passage in a way that we would not have expected. In Luke 13, verse 1, now, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him, speaking about Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this way, this fate? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. A very intriguing answer. He does not give an answer to why this particular thing happened. But he surely says it's not because of something that they personally did that they were more culpable than other people. It's not that simplistic. And I fear that this is the mindset that we often have to fight against, that it's some kind of a thing that I did or something that uh, I earned or merited or whatever it was. Uh, this notion is false because we live in a world where there is not as much justice as we would like to see. In fact, on a whole, very little. There's a lot of injustice, a lot of uh, wrong that's being perpetuated, and people often get rewarded for, for evil uh, thoughts and uh, words and deeds. But his re response is significant. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now let me, before I comment on that further, Go to the next two verses. He, this time he poses a different example. The first concerns moral evil. This one concerns what we would call natural evil, which would mean uh, that just things happen in the natural world that are inexplicable 
Why is it that some people get hit with uh, this particular situation, whether it's a disease, whether it is some kind of an accident or whatever it might happen to be, someone drowns? Um, here is an example of what's called natural evil. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Shalom fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What is he saying here? What's he doing with these two? Here we have, and I don't think this is an accident, he's looking at evil that's caused by men, in this case Pilate, with the Galileans. And then he explores a different example, this time evil that just happens in the world. Were they worse people because the tower happened to fall on them? As we all know, in this life, one second can make all the difference. One foot can make all the difference. And it's not to say that it's a question of relative righteousness or evil. In that, in that kind of a simplistic world, it would be almost as though the uh, moral consequences followed hard on a moral uh, action. For example, uh, in the physical world, it's pretty consistent. You touch a hot stove, what happens? It's going to burn you immediately and every time. I saw this stupid commercial, I forget what it was, but the guy would touch the thing and he'd burn himself and he'd go back to the thing and then touch it again and keep burning himself. What would, I don't know what that commercial was, but I don't remember the product, but I remember the idiocy. And, um, but, but we laugh at such a thing because it's just plain stupid to keep on doing the same thing expecting a different result. But uh, in this world, we have a pretty consistent situation. If you, you fall off, a, you jump off a tall building, you're, you're going to expect certain consequences that will immediately uh, fall upon you. And so all these things we have in the physical world fairly clear. But in the moral world, it's not so clear. In fact, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes 8.11 that describes it. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. What is he saying? Because there is no immediate consequence for evil deeds, people become arrogant and they suppose they can get away with it literally. And indeed, people can get away with murder. And they do get away with murder. It's the whole theme in uh, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, although in this case, um, his guilt consumes him, whereas the interesting modern twist on this by Woody Allen in Crimes and Misdemeanors, the guy gets away with murder and his guilt consumes him only for a while but because nothing happens, in fact he flourishes at the end of the film, all seems to be well for him it's an interesting thing, he did, he did a, a second movie with, based upon Crime and Punishment called Match Point, but by the time he did that movie he'd become a total cynic before, at least, he wrestled with the problem of good and evil and the, about the question of whether there's a God and morality. In Match Point, he just said it's just the luck of the draw. Basically, in this case, the metaphor is uh, seen at the beginning of the film when you see a, a tennis ball going in slow motion as the film opens. And you can see it's very close. It's going to hit the, it, the tape on the net. And you cannot tell when it hits the tape whether it's going to go back or forth. And for him, it's just a question of the luck of the, uh, of, the, of the draw. And in fact, you can, when you see the film, you thought you saw the match point, but you didn't. Later on, you see what the real match point is, and it's just basically total uh, fatalism. So he, the guy's become pretty uh, far removed from the Dostoevsky image, which really had a redemptive dimension, and that his guilt was a true moral guilt, that was truly against and an affront against the law and indeed the person of the one who made us and the one who is the source and wellspring of what is good and true. And therefore, in the Dostoevsky uh, rendition, he comes to, through his pain, through his adversity, through his suffering, ultimately he comes to redemption. And it's very significant that this happens through a prostitute. It's very amazing what he does with, this, with that um, 
with that story. But the point that Dostoevsky is trying to teach, which is deeply Christian, is that suffering can be redemptive and it can teach us something. And even though it does not seem to make sense to us and by our lights, there can still be an ultimate redemptive dimension that comes out of a thing. It's important for... So Jesus is effectively saying this. Though, do not try to understand why this happens to some people and not to others. And it's true, isn't it? I was just talking with a person um, a couple